Good morning. morning. Uh, So it is a beautiful day, and I'm just grateful to be with you uh, this week. And so I I want to talk to you uh, about a a difficult subject today as we start a new series. And and let me start it by doing this. It was about five years ago that uh, I was a discipleship pastor at a church. And while I was there, I received a very coveted invitation to go uh, and spend a week with a different church out in San Francisco. And so what had happened out there is there was a, a very well-known mega church pastor that had resigned from his position to start, of all things, a small house church movement. And so our church at the time, we were uh, doing missional communities as our discipleship strategy, which is the equivalent of small house churches all over our county. And so this represented an opportunity for me to go see some organic discipleship in its early stages. And so I took one of our house church leaders with me. Now, I'd always wanted to go to the West Coast. I'd never been to California. I just always assumed that when I went out there, it would be a romantic getaway with my wife, right? Not a a five-day trip with a six-foot-five, 280-pound ex-military bearded brute named Russ, right? But um, uh, he he was trained to actually fall asleep as soon as he laid down. So that whole week, I didn't get any pillow talk or nothing. He just, he laid his head down. He was out. Uh, His wife and I actually bonded over that later. She's like, nobody else understands, but you uh, do. And yes, but since you're, since you're thinking it, and I haven't said it, it was a very claustrophobic fight, flight, all right? But uh, uh, since our, our wives, speaking of them, they were not able to go, they were kind of upset. Uh, so they didn't get to go to the West Coast with us. So Russ's wife sent him with a list of things that she wanted him to sightsee for her. Uh, and so while we were there on the one day that we had a few hours of free time, instead of touring Alcatraz or something cool like that, uh, we drove two hours in traffic to drive up in front of one house and snap this picture. And then we just walked away. Now, if you don't know what that's a picture of, just lean into your next closest millennial and ask them. They will uh, tell you. Uh, But what we did after that, since we didn't have any time left to do anything really important, we decided at minimum we were going to drive by what is known as one of uh, the modern marvels of the world, the Golden Gate Bridge. And if I can be honest, I wish we'd had a lot more time at the Golden Gate Bridge. Because as privileged as I felt to see an organic discipleship movement begin, right, in its early stages in a very post-Christian context, There was something about that bridge, the more I thought about it, that I thought showed me a very real, a very tangible picture of what the Christian life and the Christian walk looks like. And now let me explain. Today we are starting a new series, and it's just called Tension. And tension is is what happens when there's two points that are opposite, and there's something between it. And so when it comes to Scripture, when it comes to our Christian walk, we deal with tension in different ways. So you have to understand this about tension. We come from a very, very Greek mindset. Our education system is Greek. The way we process is Greek. Our culture is Greek. And what tension represents more than anything, right, is like a struggle, is discomfort. And so when it comes to tension, as Greeks, there's three things that we tend to do. The first thing we do is this. When tension comes up, the first thing we do is we reject it. We say, I'm not okay being comfortable, I don't have to be uncomfortable, and so I reject the tension. And the second thing we do after we reject the tension is we refuse. We refuse to exist in a state of not knowing or of unknowing, because in Greek culture, the purpose of life is to have the right answers. And so if there's something that doesn't have an answer, we're not going to exist in that state. And so we refuse to exist. But then the third thing we do naturally is we then resolve that tension, because we don't want to live in it. And so that means we either have to take one of the two opposing perspectives or we have to fabricate a a truth that makes us feel better about this tension that resolves it for ourselves. Now let me explain what that looks like. I see this at funerals all the time, Christian funerals, especially if you you have someone that was lost that was unexpected or or someone that was a little bit younger. I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, they're, they're very uncomfortable, clearly. They're uncomfortable living that tension and that stress, and so they'll say something like, well, God just must have needed them up in heaven. Okay, we do that all the time. So what happens? They're, they're uncomfortable. There's a tension there. And they're not going to exist in a state of not knowing why God would let this thing happen. And so they fabricate a truth to resolve their tension. Because is it true that God needed them up in heaven? Absolutely not. But because I have that truth that I fabricated, I can sit and say, okay, I don't have to be uncomfortable with this now. All right, so that's what that looks like. But let me ask you, is that person experiencing true peace? No, they're not really experiencing peace because it's not the truth. It's a, it's a fabricated truth to resolve the tension. 
Now let's talk about the alternative perspective. See, the alternative perspective is the Jewish perspective. And most of our scripture is written from a Jewish perspective. And so when we see tension points in scripture, two opposing views that that don't feel like they go together, but they do, here's how the Jew would have approached it. The Jew would have first welcomed the tension. See, they welcomed tension because they saw it as an opportunity. And then the second thing they would do is they would wait in the tension. See, they were okay not knowing all of the answers. They were okay not knowing everything that was going on, and so they would wait on God in the middle of that tension, no matter how long it took. But then the last thing they would do with this, and this is really important, then they would wrestle with the tension. Instead of feeling like they had to choose one or the other or fabricate some false truth to make them more comfortable, they wrestled with both perspectives and therefore found the peace they were looking for because they believed that they found the presence of God by wrestling in the tension. And so the Greek mindset is very much our purpose in life is to have the right answers, but to the Jew, their purpose is, is finding the person that has the right answers and experiencing him. Right? And so here's my encouragement to you this week then uh, and this month as we go through this series. My encouragement to you is, is to don't default for answers when we have two competing tensions, but instead desire the only God. Okay? That's my encouragement for you. Don't just default. Don't just try to get away from the tension or the discomfort, but wrestle in it and experience God. Because here's what we know about tension. Tension is a force that when applied between two perspectives creates energy. And who wouldn't want more energy in their walk, right? Who wants less energy in their faith? I dare you to raise your hand, right? right? None of us. We want more energy. And so the way I think about it, it's like this. Do you remember when you were a little kid and you were in a bike race? And you were pedaling as fast as you can. Maybe you were even winning. I mean, you were going quick. And then suddenly that chain broke or fell off. Do you remember what that felt like? Suddenly you could pedal as fast as you wanted. But you weren't going anywhere? See, that's what our faith is like when we resolve tension, because it's tension that gives us energy. And so again, my encouragement to you isn't to just resolve tension, but to wrestle in it and let it give you energy to your faith. And so with that in mind, the tension that we're going to wrestle with this week is this. How do we manage the tension of being in the world, but not of the world? Have you heard that before? How do we manage the tension of being in the world but not of the world? And what scripture is going to teach us this morning is this. The way that we wrestle with that tension is by transferring the pain of our purpose to the prince of our peace. Okay, the way we're going to wrestle with that tension today that we'll see in a second is we transfer the pain of our purpose to the prince of our peace. Now to see what that looks like, we're going to be in John chapter 17 verses 13 through 19 this morning. And as you turn there, getting prepared to fall on the screen above, here's what's happening. Jesus is at the Last Supper with his disciples. And sometime in the evening, he decides to recite a prayer to God the Father. But what we can tell from the tenses in the Greek is that this prayer was most likely said out loud. It's kind of what he did at the death of Lazarus as well. He recited a prayer so that other people would hear his prayer. Right, so he kind of does that thing here again because he's God. So he wants the disciples right, to hear God's heart for them. And so he recites this prayer to God the Father for the sake of the disciples hearing Jesus' heart for them. And so that's what's happening here starting in verse 13 where it starts by saying this. It says, I'm coming to you now, Jesus saying this, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they, meaning the disciples, may have the full measure of my joy within them. And so I love this. The first thing Jesus does in this prayer is he makes his purpose known. He says, I am praying this because it is my desire, God's desire for his followers, that they would have the full measure of my joy within them. Now, it's not surprising that Jesus would want his followers to have a full measure of joy. What is surprising is the timing. Uh, Because here's what we know. At some point during this Last Supper meal... Judas has been dismissed to go and betray Jesus. And we know that he's just a couple of hours away from being so stressed and anxious about going to the cross that he's about to start sweating drops of blood. It's a a condition called hematidrosis. It, It happens very, very, very rarely. It's incredible stress and pressure. And so it's in the midst of those things, knowing that he's going to the cross, that Jesus says he wishes his followers would have the same full measure of joy that he has. Well, that doesn't make sense. 
See, but here's the thing about joy. Joy is not dependent on circumstances, right? Happiness, now happiness, that is a circumstantial feeling. But what joy is, it is a transcendent spiritual state. It's the profound satisfaction that comes with perfect obedience, And so it doesn't matter here what the circumstances of Jesus is. It doesn't matter that he's about to go to the cross and suffer and die. He can have this fullness of joy because the cross for Jesus represents perfect obedience. Him completing that which God has called him to do. So here's what that means for us today. We can't expect to experience a fullness of joy outside of obedience to the purpose that God has on our lives. Let me say that again. We can't expect to have this full measure of joy outside of obedience to the purpose that God has on our life. I just had this conversation with my brother this past week. Uh, he, he's quite a bit younger than me, 10 years younger than me. So we've got this brother relationship, but a little bit of a mentor type of relationship as well. And so he's a, a, a construction person. He, he checks out bridges. He evaluates them. And so he sits in his car a lot of the day. Uh, and so sometimes he gets bored and he's sitting there in his truck and, and he'll call me. And he called me this past week and to basically say, you know, I've done all these things, I'm sitting here, and I'm rethinking my career. Because basically he's not experiencing any satisfaction or any joy in his career at this point. Now here's something about my brother, like all of us, he has his own struggles, but one of them he came across quite naturally. As the youngest person in my family who struggled with finances his whole life, he, he felt the brunt of that more than the rest of us. And even when, when Chris and I grew up and we were missionaries and then pastors in small churches, he saw what poverty looked like. And so poverty, what does that represent? That's a tension, right? That's uncomfortable. But it's a tension that he could resolve himself. And so he resolved in his life that he wasn't going to be impoverished. And so he's done very well at that. He's an incredibly good worker. He's incredibly reliable. He's a hard worker. And so he's done well for himself financially to this point. But now he's in his mid-20s. He's been married a couple of years. He and his wife are thinking about buying a house, having children, and he's finding that he's just not satisfied. And so he calls me, he says, I'm just thinking about making a career switch. And he's talking about doing it in a field that would let him serve people in a very intimate way. And I wanted to just jump up and down and scream. And yeah, I've been praying for this for years because I've known that he's not chasing his purpose, right? He's serving the kingdom of Jake, not serving the kingdom of Jesus. And so he's been chasing money. I know that's not his purpose, but he had this concern. He says, well, I'm thinking about making a switch, but I'm going to have to take a big pay cut. And I said, I don't care, (laughs) just do it. Jump in, Nike, make it happen, it doesn't matter, just do it. It doesn't matter how it's gonna fall about, it doesn't matter if that's where you end up, just do something different. But I also told him this, I said, but don't waste this opportunity because you're in tension right now. There's a struggle that you're experiencing right now. And what I'm encouraging you to do is to not try to get rid of that tension, Don't just make it go away. Don't just find a way to to make more money into doing this. You can just don't just wrestle because this is an opportunity to grow closer to God, to discover the purpose He has for you. Because here's what we know about purpose it's easier for God to get us where He wants us if we're already moving. You ever tried to turn a car when it's at a standstill? It's a lot different than when it's already moving. And so, what I know is this that, that chasing money, right, that's not His purpose. There's not going to be joy or satisfaction in that. But by serving other people, I've seen that in his whole life. Man, you are going to find your joy. You're going to find your peace in that. But it starts with you wrestling with it. It starts with you getting in there and just doing it. And the joy that we find and the purpose that we find, that's especially true when it costs us something. In his sake, it's just a very quantifiable cost with numbers. But for all of us, no matter the field, there's always a cost with following God's purpose for our life. But the greater the cost, the greater the joy. And the reason that I talk about this in terms of wrestling is like this. Because what is wrestling? Wrestling is a struggle, right? It's a fight. Well, what are we struggling against? What are we fighting against? Well, look at verse 14. Uh, Jesus is going to tell us because he says this. He says, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. So the struggle that we're going to have, Jesus says, is they are no longer of the world. I have given them your truth, your word, uh, mostly that I am the Christ. I am the son of the living God. The salvation and hope and purpose is found in me. And they have received that truth, which means they are now no longer, excuse me, of this world. 
just as I am not of this world, Jesus says. Now, to be of this world means this. To be of this world is to share the same outlook of the world. And the outlook of the world is hostility toward God. Right? And so Jesus was not of this world. He wasn't born into this world. He chose to come into this world, right? But he preexisted the world. And he can't have hostility against God because he is God, right? And so Jesus is an alien to this world. But what he's saying is the disciples who were born into this world, who at one point were hostile toward God, they are no longer so. Why? Because they've been born again, Right? Instead of of the flesh, now of the spirit. And so what Jesus is saying now is they are still in this world, but they do not belong to it anymore. They are in a place that they call home, but it's not their home because they belong outside of this world. And so this is the perspective that, that Jesus is giving them. And if Jesus was treated a certain way as one the world was hostile toward, Right? The enemies of God treated Jesus in a specific way. What makes them think that they also aren't going to receive that same treatment? Right? So that's where this wrestling and tension is going to come in, that when we receive the truth and we are born again, we are no longer of this world, but we are still in it. So how exactly do we manage that tension by a place of we're not home, but we still live here? Well, the next three verses are going to give us perspective on that. Starting in 15, which says this, it says, My prayer, again, Jesus is still talking, is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Now, we've been having this conversation here specifically the last few weeks about this kingdom that exists that we don't see, of, of light and darkness. Our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, against the principalities, the evil forces of this world. This is Jesus affirming that reality again. And here's what he's saying about it. You know, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, here's what that did. The death and resurrection of Jesus, that spelled defeat for Satan, right? Spells defeat for the ruler of this world, but that also does not rob him of his power to still inflict terrible damage on those outside of the protection of God. That's what's going to create this struggle. And so Jesus is affirming this. But he says this thing that's interesting because he preemptively says, do not take them out of this world, just protect them from, from Satan while they're in it. Why would he say that? Well, because when things get hairy, and Jesus knows they're about to get real hairy, the very prayer of the disciples is probably going to be, kill me, take me now, take me out of this world, let me go to heaven, let me be there. And Jesus knows this because there's a long line of God's messengers that did this exact same thing. I mean, look in the Old Testament, look at the prophets, whether it was Moses, whether it was Elijah, whether it was Jonah, at some point, every single one of them prayed that they might die, that God would take them out of this world because in their mind, it was better to be removed from this world than to suffer for, for, for them what appeared to be a lost cause. And so Jesus is, is basically foreshadowing here, you're going to suffer greatly, you're going to want to die, but God don't take them out of the world because here's what God doesn't do. He doesn't take his servants out of this world because his servants' whole purpose is to be in this world. He doesn't remove us from it because our purpose is to exist in the pain, to exist in the suffering, to offer hope and a beacon of light for those in an otherwise lost and dark world. That is our purpose. And so Jesus is going to start reiterating that because that's going to be hard for these disciples to hear. You're going to suffer greatly. And so, so he says here in 16, he says, this is the second time, he says that they are not of the world even as I am not of it. And so again, Jesus says, this is not your home. You are not of the world. And if this is, is not your home, you can't expect comfort, right? We, we associate comfort with home. He says, this isn't your home. Don't expect to be comfortable. Because if the one that we are following had to suffer the way Jesus had to suffer, what makes us think that we don't? Well, I'll tell you what makes us think that we don't. The lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy that says suffering is always bad. What if suffering isn't always bad? See, in the last few years, there's some of these Eastern religious ideals from Buddhism and Hinduism. They've started to make their way like yeast into Christian doctrine. And the reason that that's happening is because in these Eastern religions, the whole purpose of life is to alleviate suffering. 
And so I'm seeing more and more of that making its way into Christianity of people saying, wait, 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 no, I want parts of this over here with parts of this. I don't want to have to suffer, and so I'm going to believe these things. I'm going to create these theologies about Jesus that say I don't have to suffer. But that's worldly, because what did Jesus say? See, Jesus said to follow after me is to what? To take up your cross. What does a cross represent? Suffering. See, the purpose of the Christian life, my friends, it is not to eradicate suffering. Our call is to embrace the suffering that comes with following Jesus. That's a hard message, but it's right here. Now, why would we do that? Why would we submit to the suffering? Why would we embrace the suffering that comes from living in the world but no longer being of it? Well, verse 17, I think, is going to give us some clues where it says this. It says, Jesus' prayer is to sanctify them by the truth. He says, your word is truth as you have sent me into the world. I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. Now, sanctification, that's one of those big uh, Christianese words. But, But what it means is to simply be set apart or to be made holy for God's purposes. But the thing about sanctification that's so important is it is a process, And even this term fullness of joy we've been talking about today, in the first century rabbinic writings, that was an eschatological term. And so what that means is this, whether we're talking about sanctification, whether we're talking about this fullness of joy, they are not yet fully realized, right? We can't have a fullness of joy now. We have a fullness of joy when we complete the mission that God has called us, right? Jesus was getting ready to go to the cross and complete it, so he was entering into the fullness of joy, right? Because right now, what does joy do? It shares a seat at the table with things like grief, right, and sorrow and pain, right, so we can have joy now, but the fullness of joy comes when the pain and the grief and the sorrow no longer exist, but joy still does. Well, sanctification's in the same way. We start the process now, but it's not fully completed, right, until the other side of heaven, until God welcomes us home and says, well done, my good and faithful servant, but that doesn't mean there's not a purpose to it. In fact, there's a very important purpose to sanctification, And the best way, I think, to understand is to think about pure metals, some of these valuable metals like gold, right? Gold has inherent value simply because it's gold. But let's say you go home today and your puppy has dug up a gold nugget. Does it have value? Yes. But its full value is not yet realized, right? What's the first thing you have to do to start realizing the value of this gold? You have to put it in a fire. You have to apply intense heat Because when gold is heated, right, when it's intensely under that kind of pressure and it heat, that's when all of the impurities get burnt off, right? And so then you have just the pure gold remaining. So is that valuable? Yeah. But if that puppy cooled off and you set that gold nugget on your mantle, would it have more value than before? Yes. But would its full value be realized? Not yet. Why? Because the other part of that process is when gold is heated, it becomes malleable and it gets formed into the image of something. See, gold will find its value as a wedding ring, right? When it's shaped into something that represents something else. That's where gold finds its real value. So the value of gold then is that it becomes like a wedding ring and it represents this covenant of love that exists between two people. Well, we're the same way. See, if if we want to be sanctified, if we want to be set apart for the purposes of God, the same things happen. We have to be put in the fire, right? We have to experience intense heat. Because it's in the fire that all of the impurities get burned off. And yeah, that's more valuable, but we're not finished because we have to be made into the image of something. In our case, it is the image of Christ. And we're only made malleable when we're under intense heat, intense pressure. That's when we get stretched, right? That's when tension is applied. It's when compression is applied. It's when the master takes it and forms it into whatever it is that holds value because it represents a covenant of love. That's our life too. And so the purpose then of this sanctification right, is so that we become like Christ, so that we look like Christ, so that we can complete the mission that God has given us. He is sanctifying us for a purpose to complete the mission he has given us so that one day we will realize the fullness of joy when we complete that task in perfect obedience. That's what God uses suffering for. Uh, And so how do these verses then, how do they help us understand and manage that tension of being in the world but not of it? Well, it's like this. When we experience pain, When we experience suffering, we're going to do one of two things, right? We can retreat from it and try to resolve it on our own, right? That's one option, or we can wrestle with it. 
and we can lean into it. And we can understand that God's presence is in that pain. We can understand that his purpose for us is in that suffering. It's kind of like a window into the future to which he has called us to. The purpose of your life, you can wipe it off and you can see beyond it when you are in pain and in suffering because he is preparing you for something specific. And so you're probably sitting here saying, well, that's all well and good. Thank you for explaining that theological concept to me. But I am in pain and it hurts. I'm in pain, so even if I said, you know what, maybe I shouldn't run away from it, maybe I shouldn't resolve it, maybe I should wrestle with it, what does that actually look like? Well, for that, we're going to go back to the Golden Gate Bridge real quick. Here's what I love about the Golden Gate Bridge. It is a compression bridge, which means this, or excuse, it is a suspension bridge, excuse me, which means it is suspended, right? There's something that holds it up, kind of like God holds us up. Uh, and it has this purpose to help people get from one side uh, to the other. And it's a modern marvel of the world that it's able to do this. No other bridge can do it like this. Because here's what we know about bridges, all bridges of any size. There are two forces at work that they have to deal with. They are always going to have to deal with compression. And they're always going to have to deal with tension. Right? Compression is what happens when a bridge does this, like when it goes in, right? And if compression is not dealt with well, if it's not written into the design of the bridge, it will cause the bridge to buckle and it will destroy it. But on the other side of that is tension, right? When that bridge gets stressed at, stretched out. And if that is not uh, taken to a different point, if that's not worked into the design of the bridge, it will snap the bridge. Either way, the bridge is rendered useless, And so the Golden Gate Bridge is so incredible because it deals with both of those over incredibly long distance, both compression and tension. And so here's what they figured out. Here's how you deal with compression on a bridge. You dissipate it. See, compression puts all of the force into one small area, and when that one small area is overcome by the pressure of the force, that's when it buckles. And so they have to dissipate it over greater areas of the bridge and so that 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 pressure is shared by a greater part of the bridge. But here's how they deal with tension. Tension is dealt with differently. Tension doesn't create buckling, it creates a snap. And so you don't dissipate tension, you transfer tension. Those two big things that that you see, those two towers, right, that's where where the tension's transferred to because those two towers are grounded. They are in the foundation of the earth. And so so the, the pressure that can't be handled by the tension of the bridge can be handled by those towers because they're grounded. And the Golden Gate Bridge does both of those at the same time. So how does that look like our life? What does that look like for the Christian life? Well, let me say this. At any point in time, all of us are experiencing both compression and tension. At any point in time, all of our lives have this pressure on us. These things that we're internalizing. All this pressure from my job, uh, from my family, All these things at school I feel over my head. So there's this pressure applied on us, and we internalize that pressure. And the first thing we do is we retreat in that pressure, right? We run away from it. We want to try to resolve it, right? Kids, they cut themselves. People use drugs. We use alcohol, pornography, all kinds of things to try to alleviate that pressure. That's compression. But what has God given us? He's given us his church, so that we can spread that pressure out over a greater space. That's what it means to shoulder one another burdens, to take that compression pressure, that force, and instead of just getting all twisted up inside, we spread it out and we share that and we shoulder one another burdens. Right, so that's what that looks like. But what about that tension? Let's go back to the gold analogy for a second. When when gold's being stretched out, I don't know if you've ever watched those glass blowing shows. But they stretch it too far, the tension's too great, what happens? It, it snaps. Well, we're pulled in a thousand different directions. And so while we're dealing with that internal pressure, there's also things pulling on us in life that are stretching us out, that, that are changing who we are. And if we're not careful, we'll snap. So we have to transfer that tension. Where? To our base, to our foundation to our anchor, to our ground, which for us as Christians is the testimony that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God, and he's already defeated death. And so I know I'm gonna suffer. I know I don't experience the fullness of his joy until heaven, but I can have some of it now. I know that that my sanctification isn't gonna complete until heaven, but but I, I start it now. 
Because when, when, when you're getting stretched, that's an opportunity for God to grow you. And so when you're experiencing that tension, you can run away from it and try to resolve that tension, but you're not going to see the person that God has called you to be because you're running away from it. And so what we do in those moments is we take that tension and we say, God, I'm taking this to you. This is beyond my capacity. I have to transfer this from my weakness to your strength. And so I'm going to sit in this and wrestle with this. And I may not know all of the answers, but I trust you and I'm giving it to you. That's where true peace is found because he is the prince of peace. And so, so that's what I mean this morning when I say we wrestle with the tension of being in the world but not of it by doing this, by transferring the pain of our purpose to the prince of our peace. Because when we are walking with purpose, it's going to hurt. It's going to be uncomfortable. There will be suffering because we're not of the world. But Jesus, who we are of, is our Prince of Peace. And so we, we take all of that stuff that we're feeling and we take it to him and that's where we find our peace. Now let me explain just, just real quick what that looked like. I know for Chris and I, uh, early, early on, right after we graduated from Bible college, we had a, a residency program we'd signed on for. And, and they made all these prob- promises to us, you know, we're going to have housing for you. Uh, we're going to have a whole residency program set up. Uh, just all of these things, you know, all we had to do was get out there because they weren't paying us or anything. So we needed to take care of some things. But once we got out there, none of that was in place. Uh, there was no residency program established. I was their first resident. Uh, it was a total catastrophe. I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I didn't know who to talk to. I just sat and stared at a wall most days. Right? I also had this pressure internally. I had to finish and graduate school while I was still there, do my classes online. So I had all these pressures. Right? They were eating away inside of me. But they also, they, they didn't have a house for us. They didn't have anywhere for us to live. And so they had to ask the church. And they found a farming couple that had a small uh, farmhouse but they still had kids about our age, so they weren't empty nesters, and so they had one room. And so we went from living in a house to like this 10 by 10 room. And so we find ourselves in the situation uh, where we're, we're living in a place that isn't our home, right? And, and we know we're not in this place forever, it's for a season, three or six months in our case. But we're feeling all of this compression, and, and we were so far removed from the church, we were 30 miles out in the countryside that we couldn't dissipate that compression. And we were getting stretched as we were trying to graduate school and, and see what real pastors did and see what real church was like. We were being stretched, and God was trying to do something. But we were too young and stupid. We didn't know what to do with that tension. We didn't know to lean into it. We didn't know to take it back to God. And so our, our immediate reaction was to run, right? And so there was kind of a falling out between us and the church. We're like, you didn't hold up your end. We don't know what to do. We're, we're feeling all this compression. We're feeling all this tension. And, and I'm just going to snap. And so... I ended up taking a, a job as lead pastor at a very, very small church because it was the only thing I could get. Do you know what had to happen? God had to do it again because I didn't learn it the first time. Right? I didn't lean into it the first time. Was the pain real? Yeah. Was the suffering real? Yeah, it was. It was really bad. I mean, it was really bad. But we didn't lean into it. We ran from it. So God had to do it again because he was teaching us. He was leading us. He was transforming us. He was sanctifying us. I couldn't be here today with you if I hadn't learned that lesson. You know, this is if I had had cleared off the window, this is the future I would have seen. He was preparing me to do things like this, but it couldn't happen until I was sanctified, until he burned off that pride, until he burned off all of those other things that I was struggling with. So if if I had resolved that on my own, I just couldn't be used in the way that he wants to use me. It's the same thing for you. See, what you have to understand, I know a lot of you are in pain. I know a lot of you are suffering. I know there's a struggle. But the greater the struggle, the more opportunity there is to grow intimate with God. If you run from your struggle, you're not going to grow intimate with God. And you're not going to have peace. But if you run to God, if you push in, if you lean into the pain, if you lean into the struggle, if you lean into the suffering, that's when you experience his peace because that's where he is. The presence of God is in the pain. There's a purpose in your pain. God wants to use your suffering to turn you into the person that he's called you to be to do what he's called you to do. And so I I know that's not an easy message. I I know it'd be easier for me to stand up here and say, hey, if you you love Jesus, you don't have to struggle or suffer, but that's just not truth. So instead, what I tell you is this. We do this now as a beginning part of the process, and we experience joy from our obedience now And yeah, it's partial joy, 
but it is our obedience that transforms us into the likeness of Christ so that we have that fullness of joy later. Because verse 12 of this passage, Jesus lamenting over the fact that Judas wasn't obedient to the end, and he lost him. And so his prayer for the rest of the disciples, they lean into this pain and be transformed because that's what's going to give them what they need to finish the race, to do what God has called them and to experience the fullness of joy that Jesus is experiencing right now as he goes to the cross. And so that's what I mean when I say this morning, if you are struggling, if you're in that tension, if you're being stressed, if you're being compressed, take that purpose of your pain and take it to the Prince of Peace. Lean in it so he can do what he's doing in your life because he has set you apart. He has made you holy. He is sanctifying you for his purposes. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter your struggles. He's using you now and he wants to keep using you So submit to that process, even when it's hard. Don't run from it. Wrestle with it, because that's where God is. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father God, I just thank you that that you walked this life, that you're not sitting up there Monday morning quarterbacking, but you, you actually came down, and you experienced pain, and you experienced suffering, You experienced what it was like to be an alien in this world so that you could show us the way that we are to walk. And so as we we transition, God, into a time of response this morning, I just pray that that those out there that are in pain, that are in tension, that are compressed, that feel like they're they're getting all torn up inside, are about to to snap, God, that you would give them courage and the confidence to to dissipate their struggle, to, to, to grab a friend in the church, to talk to their small group, to share their struggles with others. I also pray that if people are being stretched, God, that they would have the courage to take that tension, God, and take it to you and not run from it, but lean into it. So God, I pray for extra measures of peace. Pray for extra measures of joy. I pray for clarity as people try to walk in your purpose. And in their obedience, God, would you bring them joy this morning? A joy that doesn't make sense, that that circumstances don't affect, but a joy that is transcendent because of their obedience to what you have called them to do. So God, I ask you to clarify that calling this morning to to give extra measures of the peace and the joy. And God, just to be known through our life so that one day we can see you again as you welcome us into heaven with a job well done. God, we love you and we thank you not only for that day that's coming that is our hope, but for today that we still have hope because of you. It's in Jesus' name I pray.